Marek, welcome to Sports Earth. It's really good to chat to you about your career and what you're currently up to and your involvement from a coaching perspective. So thank you so much for your time, Marek. Really appreciate it. Thank you. No, it's actually a pleasure. Great to be on board here. Thank you, man. Now, it's not for your school career. Kingswood College has produced some great cricketers over the years, you know. <laughs> what do you believe has contributed to the success? You know, look at in terms of yourself, Brett Schultz, and even recently, like Murray Birch. What has contributed to the school success in producing such good cricketers? Um, I think it's the coaching side of it. Um, I was at Dell Junior um, for, for my junior schools, and then obviously high school, I went to Kingswood, I went on a bursary. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it with government schools, I don't think you'll, you'll get the coaches. Maybe today, the coaches have changed a little bit, but mm. in those days, um, we never, uh, the, the, the private, the government schools never really got the coaches that the school needed. Um, and uh, the private schools seem to have got all the coaches and the best coaches they could get hold of, you know. So we had overseas coaches, um, and I think that's where it's, it started. You know, you, you get professional coaches in to coach uh, kids at school. I think it makes a hell of a difference. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, if we fast forward a few years, you obviously did very, very well. And we'll talk about your South African career a bit later. But I first want to talk about a bit of your coaching that you did. Um, and you assisted the Netherlands and Namibia in cricket. Were you always keen to try your hand at, at coaching? Yeah, I, looked, I, I took a break for a little while and I thought, you know, let me just give it back with you. And then I went, cricket gave me. Um, yeah. you know, I, I learned a lot as well. So it was for me to give back to cricket as well. And I was approached by Namibia to go and assist me with Gary Kirsten. He was the batting coach and I was the batting coach for, you know, it was a week or uh, every now and again they'd call us um, for about a week in a month, in the following month, another week. Mm. Um, and it worked well, you know, it, it, uh, they did well at the time. Um, and then I was the overseas uh, pro for, for uh, VFC in, in England, uh, I mean in, in the Netherlands, yes. uh, for, t- for two years and I was player coach for that part as well. So we won the league the first year I was there, we came second in the second year. Uh, it, it, it was enjoyable, a, a different type of cricket. You play a majority of your games on mats in, in the Netherlands. Sure. On those, on those koi mats. Um, and it's very... Sure. Um, yeah, uh, it depends who you play against as well. If it's a home side and you've got a good spinner, you can pull the mat tight, you know, <laughs> and loosen the mat on the one side. And if you've got a quick bowler from the other side, you tighten the mat on the other side. So yeah. it also plays, it plays a role as well. So not many people know about that. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You see, it adds another dynamic to cricket. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and do you think it's... Uh, yeah. Sorry? No, carry on. No, 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 I thought oh, okay. made things very, very interesting when you came there. You just you you were actually prepared, you know. You say, oh, we we we're playing against Ben Haig this this afternoon or uh, during the day, and uh, they've got this spinner to be prepared, and you can choose, um, you know, your your batting lineup according. Sure, that's interesting, yeah. And, but I think you must have had an advantage though, because you know, if they talk Dutch, you would pretty much get a gist of what's going on. Yes, I did. Uh, well, eighty percent of what was uh, what they were talking about, you could sort of pick up and understand. And uh, they actually loved the Afrikaans as well. That, 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 that is that is a way to speak Dutch, not Dutch that they speak today. But um, yes. yeah, it was enjoyable. I, I understood what they were talking about. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but Mary, do you think it's a matter of time before the the smaller teams, so to say, start pushing for places more often? at World Cups, you know, when I think the Netherlands came to the World Cup, Sham Herschel gives the story to them, unfortunately. Um, but do you think it's a matter of time before they start pushing more often to actually be in the World Cup? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be nice to see, you know, more of those uh, minnow teams come mm. into the World Cup and that. I know that they only push two in, you know, they have that, uh, their own minnow competition and that, and two go through or something like that. Yeah. I'm not too sure what, it, what the rules are today, but it'll be nice to, to have them there as well, just to boost them and boost the country. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I would definitely like to see a lot more of those minnow sides coming through, you know, the Scotland, the Ireland, uh, the Netherlands, and all those guys, you know, it'll be lucky to see them. Yes, absolutely. I reckon Scotland's a team to watch out as well. I know those guys have been working blimmin' hard on and off the field, so yeah, that's a team yeah, to watch out, yeah. I reckon. But then, Marek, you also spent some time in India, didn't you? You were with Rajasthan Royals. Yeah, well, not Rajasthan Royals. What, I, what happened was that I 
I was approached by a guy by the name of Shamshi Sham- Sham- Singh, who played for, for the Rajasthan Ranji side, which right. is the first class side. Right. And that feeds into the RPL. Um, it's the first class side, same as what we have here, the local side here, the um, Cape Cobras and uh, Warriors, that type of thing. So yeah. the same sort of setup. I was approached by him to to direct and, and be head of, of coaching for the Jaipur Cricket Academy in wow. Jaipur, in Rajasthan. And I ran an academy, we had about 70 odd kids there. Um, and then I was, I was there for, what, five years? Um, sure. But not at, not at Jaipur Cricket Academy, but the first two years I was there, I managed to get about seven players from the academy into the first class side, wow. into the Rajasthan Ranji first class side. And then they, they saw that happening. Um, there were more bowlers, of course, than they were batters. Of course, the batters <laughs> better in my life, but yeah, I was in coach batting. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they managed to get quite a few of the bowlers from the academy into the Rajasthan first class side. Um, and then the Rajasthan Cricket Association approached me and said, you know, wouldn't I would like to get involved with um, Rajasthan uh, itself, the setup? And obviously, uh, Sham Sham was very excited about it. And um, I was brought in as the bowling coach for Rajasthan for, for two years. In the first season I was there, we we won the we won the trophy in the first year. Uh, in the second year, I think we came third. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think I ran into a little bit of difficulties. It's very political. No. Uh, there are 21 states there. And, yeah. I mean, the 21, 21 states alone in Rajasthan itself. And sure. you've got these different... Um, boards from these different uh, states, you know, so, and they try to outdo each other and, mm. you know, the one board came in and over, overran the board that was currently running, that brought me into Rajasthan. Um, didn't agree with, with my, uh, didn't agree with an overseas coach and they wanted local coaches, so that's no mind end. Yeah, so that's where mine ended and obviously came back to South Africa. Yeah, well, yeah, politics, it, it's, it's sad, but it's true. But then, yeah. Mary, did you ever get to experience a bit of the RPL there while you were there? Man, I tried my best. Uh, RPL, <laughs> it's very, again, it's very, very difficult to get into yeah. RPL. It's very, okay. you know, and, uh, yes. you know, if you've got, um, I don't know if I should be saying it, but if you've got enough money, you can get yourself in there. That's, yes, uh, yes. It is. Yeah, no, for sure. No, 100%. Yeah. But looking at the tournament, it really is like a hub of talent for India. I think they've got something there that's going to reap benefits now and I think for many more years to come. Do you think that puts them in sort of the forefront of player development? 100%. And, and that is, I, I can guarantee you that probably 60 70% what you're seeing at the RPL is, is of talent. Yeah. Uh, there's another that 30 40% is still sitting out there purely because sure. those families don't have the money for them to pay yeah. to get into RPL. That's the big thing. Yeah. Um, I know, I won't mention names or anything, but I know a couple of families um, while I was there that because they're so wealthy and that then their kids aren't actually good enough to play in the RPL or be in the squad of 18 of the players but because they've got a little bit of cash, um, you know, their kids uh, get put into the squad yeah. to be among, among those players. It's wow. very sad, but yeah. we're, not, we're, not, we're not seeing 30, 40% of, of their talent. They are extremely talented there. I mean, I had a guy that, uh, was, that brought him off the street. Uh, he didn't have to pay academy fees. And he was the fastest in Rajasthan. He was clocking at 150 k an hour. And, um, you know, he wasn't even getting looked at. So I tried to wow. get him into their Delhi, their Delhi, their Delhi Devils um, uh, pre-season, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, you know, they have a look at the, uh, what, they, what they got and what yeah. they can buy. Yeah. So I said, this kid oh. there, they paid for his flight and their accommodation, and he bowled two overs and then he sent him back home again. You know, it was one of those. <laughs> <things>. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. That is uh, incredible. My word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's one of those things. It, that's nuts. And unfortunately, yeah. I think we do see a little bit in South Africa as well, but yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's politics everywhere you go, but yeah, that is sad to hear. But talking uh, about Clean South Africa, and a little bird whispered to me that, you know, when, when um, Fletchy was your coach, he one night had to put you through your paces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently you told him that you he can never break you. 
I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and think now who told you that story. But yes, it is quite true. I mean, we did we did go out and had a few, have a few beers. I think there were four or five of us that were not back in bed before uh, midnight. The curfew was twelve o'clock. So obviously, a couple of us carried on a little bit longer than that, and then he gave us a, a little off dawn of the next day. And uh, yeah, you know, two three of them, he said, okay, you two can go, or you three can go, and then you two can stay. So he, he set me uh, up as a a senior player example, and he, and he had Ryan Merritt as uh, the junior example, and he made us carry on and carry on, and Ryan Merritt ended up puking and everything, and then he said, okay, Ryan, you can go, Very you stay on, and of course, all the players were sitting on the side of the touch line there, on the boundary line, watching what was going on there, and I carried on with Duncan, and he, and he, he just, I just, I think I got the second wind, and he couldn't do anything to me, whatever he asked me to do, I did. And then uh, it was the end of the day training and we walked into the dressing room and there was a case of beers in the fridge and I picked, pulled a beer out of the, out of the color, uh, uh, fridge and I walked up to him and I cracked it in front of him and I said, Fletch, you'll never break. <laughs> 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 and thank goodness it was pre-season and not in the season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's brilliant. Oh, my word. <laughs> I yeah. can I can't can imagine the expression on his face because I mean, yeah, no, he just sat up laughing. <laughs> it can only be you. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done, Beric. That's yeah. excellent. <laughs> but, and yeah. when you were playing for Western Province, and then that funny man Brett Shorts joined, you shortly after went and and you know played for the Eastern Province. Uh, had it got anything to do with the fact that you had to run into the wind and ball? <laughs> I was waiting for that question. That was very cool. Yeah, very cool. Now he said, give me a finger. Look at his big body. He's got to run with the wind. He looks like a bloody toothpick. There's you no wind will keep you back. He runs through the wind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, he said, you feel the wind. He says, I'm too big to run into the wind. It's going to hold you back. If you're so thin, you can run through the wind. <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, you guys are cool to each other, eh? Sure. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's yeah. good that there's, there's good gesturing and the guys obviously had a lot of fun and picking at each other, so it's good. It's really, really good. Yeah. But, yeah although we, we had those moments, you unfortunately also had a bit of a sad moment when you, you got hit in the eye. Um, and I'd say that, that obviously have a de- devastating effect on your test career. You know, how did you deal with that, that sort of disappointment? Yeah, sure. Um, I remember clearly as if it happened yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. um, he just bowled a, a bowled a ball to me, which I then I could hook, and, and I hooked him for four. And the other ball, I just totally missed it. It just went above my bat and straight in the eye. And, mm-hmm. and I couldn't survive that because I could hook. I always opened my visor a little bit wider, which um, I shouldn't have done, and it went straight in the hit my eye. Um, and I woke up two days later in hospital, and you know, I found a. I found my, my tear shirt lying next to the bed in the hospital bed next to me full of blood and it, and it, it was found by him saying, um, I'm best wishes, Jalagal Srinath, I'm very sorry. Sure. Um, so he actually came to the hospital to come and say how's it and see how I was. And, yeah, look, it was called a friendship to it. Uh, I mean, I, I believe the nurses and the doctors told me that there were quite a, a few of them that came in there. Tendulkar was apparently there as well, so I didn't know who came in, but it was nice. It was good, a good thing that he did that he came in and, um, you know, afterwards the media said to me, am I going to sue the, the helmet company? In no way is going to do that. It, it was, that was my, mm. my doing. I should have closed the visor. It's got nothing to do mm. with the helmet or anything like that. It was my problem. But I, I, it took a while for me to get back and get out of it again. And, you know, Duncan Fletcher, we were in the net, but him down to me to try to get over it, and it took a long, long time to get over it. Um, yeah, and I think I missed, uh, missed a few a few one-day games and then came back again and was back on track again. Yeah, that's excellent. But I mean, yeah, it's quite summing <laughs> to experience that. I would, don't wish it upon anyone. Yeah, quite, yeah. A, quite a summing up. But, Marek, you obviously did the exceptional things with the ball. Um, and, and your first cross career, you had a bowling average of 2.77. I mean, that's absolutely brilliant. It, it wasn't down to the absolute control that you just had of, of the ball and, you know, and the swing. You just controlled that so, so well. Yeah, I 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of people ask me now how you swing the ball. Like, I'll, I'll teach people how to swing the ball, but there's a certain certain way on your on your fingers, on your middle finger and your thumb that you've got to get right. And, and I think, you know, I try to coach it to kids and they seem to find it very difficult to do. I think it's just one of those things, it's just a one-sort of thing that, that, that I got... Uh, used to it, I suppose. I don't know. You know, nobody taught me how to swing a ball. It just came naturally. Yes. Um, and then I, I explained to some of the kids sometimes. You know, it's you can picture an aeroplane, a propeller aeroplane flying. If the one engine is not uh, turning as good as the one on the left hand side, you know, it's not going to fly properly. It's not going to go as quickly as as it should be. And it's the same as, as swing bowling. If your body is not in perfect position, perfect shape, your ball is not going to swing as much as it should. Um, and that's the whole thing about swing bowling. If, if you're not in perfect position, your arm is not in the right position, your, your, your legs are not in the right position, it, it's not going to swing. Mm. So that, that, that was the thing of, when I call it art. It is, it is an art and it, it has to be perfect for a ball to swing. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I just... I just always brought that better to to me. I didn't like going to them. You know, they must come to me, and <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's how I took it. <laughs> well, that's excellent. But you know, just touching on that, and I think, and you know, I've been involved in the school environment for a while. Is it also a bit of a fear from the coaches? So you get you get a youngster. He swings the ball so much, and it's almost like you know he bowls a wide, and then he gets it feels like he's letting the side down, gets a bit disappointed, and says that's it. I'm holding the ball across him. I'm not going to try swing the ball anymore. And then it's a fear of failure. You know, how the coach should actually be encouraging him. Said, look, but it doesn't matter that it's swung so much. Keep doing it. We just got to learn how to control it. Yes, hundred percent. No, hundred percent. Um, it is a control is very, very important and, and kids can lose it very, very quickly when they see it swinging too much, swinging too much. You've got mm-hmm. to find that line and, yes. and, and your positioning has got to be you know, on on tap all the time. And, if, you know, if your foot is out a little bit to the left, that ball's not going to swing and it's going to go down leg side and he's going to shout at the coach and say, coach, so, you know, why is this swing mm-hmm. down leg side, that type of thing. So you yourself as a child have got to know why that ball went down the leg side and it didn't swing because your foot went to the left hand side or your left arm was was open and not uh, straight down the line those type of things you know? yeah yeah it just makes you think of the book that Bob Wilmer you know did with the, the science of cricket there's so much in there there's so much detail uh, I don't know yeah, if people are patient enough to go through it but yeah <clears throat> What I'm trying to say is I agree with you. Just looking at those different perspectives, it's very, really, very interesting. It's it's good. And that's why cricket's such a unique game. It's it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I know for sure. But you you're a man of many talents. And you can eat you feel some closer. Yes, I'm feeling closer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, they, they ended up calling me the white sack warmer <laughs> when I was talking to sport. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it must be quite interesting to hear you talk that lingo. Are, are we going to yeah. hear you perhaps in the future commentate on a few more games? Man, uh, I would like to to have carried on. I would have, well, super sport. I would like super sport to have carried on as cricket. They dropped it in cricket because of the viewing. They were they went the viewing right. in Tosa wasn't high enough for them to continue um, to do right. the commentary. Rugby is huge. Yes, they they've got it flying. Hmm. They just couldn't get it right, and they tried and tried and tried with closer commentary, and it just uh, the viewing uh, just wasn't there in closer. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, well, we, we better we better create, better create some awareness and get you back on as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, Merrick, um, is the Pringle Foundation still up and running? How are things going there? Ah, uh, gee, we tried we tried everything with the Pringle Foundation to, try, to raise awareness, raising funds, having okay. golf days, having doing and doing that. It's just we weren't raising enough funds to put kids to school, and it was a, it's a, it's a, it's a very sad. You know, I had an interview with. Uh, Tommy Mbangwa on Super Sport, he flew down from Joburg to, to Cape Town and interviewed me and uh, about the academy and everything. And it was advertised on Super Sport as well. And uh, mm. I never got any, any feedback from anybody as to uh, how can we help you type of thing. Oh, okay. so, yeah, so we just had to say, well, that's it, we can't do anymore, you know. Yeah, well, at least you tried, Merrick. And I think a lot of people, yeah. yeah, at least you tried. You, the intention was good. So maybe, who knows, maybe we can chat about it a few other ways and maybe like awareness is a big thing. So, yeah. yeah. 
for sure. Yeah, sorry about that, but yeah, you never know. Maybe something will revive it along down the line. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> so, Beric, um, are you currently involved in ostrich farming? Yes. How, how is that going? Yeah, this is my first, second season. We've just, just started the second season now at the beginning of September. The first season went off very well. It wasn't uh, wasn't that great as, you know, COVID hit everybody and also hit the ostrich industry uh, very, very badly with our, we export feathers and we export skins to, into Europe and to China and to America. And um, just obviously with COVID, uh, we couldn't do that. Everything was stockpiled. And, mm, uh, mm, mm. And of course, the the, the, the the meat meat industry also was closed because we had a huge contract with the majority of hotels and bed and breakfast and restaurants and everything, and they were all closed during COVID. So, uh, yeah. um, so we were hit quite badly with you know, on that front. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it, it's going well. Um, I'm busy with uh, management, management birds at the moment. Um, uh, the, the, which, which means they they about 100, between 100 and 120 kilo uh, birds that we we um, manage for the ostrich owners, and then um, I'm also a chick raiser. So I raise ostriches from day one when they day old until they until they 120 kilos, and then they, they come and fetch them. Gee whiz! But then you know how, how fast does an ostrich run then? <laughs> You're talking from experience, man. Have you ever had one yeah, after you? No, no, I've had some bad experiences, yeah. I've had it down through a fence that you can't down through, which I've had it down through. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to go in. When they get a bit bigger, you don't want to be in that camp. Um, we do our feeding outside the camp. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we you send, send the other guys inside there to pick up the feathers that are lying, that are lying around. <laughs> you don't want to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! Yeah, but, it must but be. We, we, yeah, we just hope that we, it's opened up again now. The, the ostrich industry, you know, a few, good few years ago, uh, lost over sixty thousand in the whole of South Africa due to sure. the bird flu and the swine flu and that. So, he was. Um, and the reason they they're taking them, shifting them away from Oatsworn is because of of diseases and that. You know, so yeah. them into different places. So we are about seven or eight. Uh, Ostrich uh, uh, farmers down the eastern Cape, and they try and spread them all over the place just to get them away from diseases and that. Sure, interesting, very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, from a from a from a cricketer to a coach to a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like I said, there are many talents, and you can talk like four different languages. There we go. So and, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and as we sort of draw to an end, um, and maybe having a comparison is a terrible thing, but it just seems, you know, when you play cricket as a professional in your time to now, um, is, is that intensity still there, or is it sort of wavering? I feel the same. You know, for some people, it'll obviously have different reasons. But uh, yeah, I don't want to say you want that, that they're in there for the money and stuff like that. But yes, mm. it is. The money is big, especially the RPL yeah. uh, is, is huge. Um, the likes of Amy de Villiers, I'd like to see him. I'm not saying he's retired because he's got too much money in that, but or it's family reasons. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'm sure South Africa would like to see him continue playing uh, and or come out of retirement and play again. Yes. I mean, he's still playing in RPL. I, saw, I watched the game the other night and I saw him scoring big runs again for mm. uh, the World Challengers Bangalore. Yes. So, it, it, I, I, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. I mean, is it getting better or is it worse? I, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, you look at it the other day when they, uh, I think it was the Rajasthan Royals, broke that record of the highest T20 chase, 226 or something ridiculous. It's yeah. like they all, the RPL guys sit around the table and say, right. <laughs> How can we make this season better than the next? And I'm not to make the boundary smaller. <laughs> but it's just yeah. crazy. But that's the only way you can do it. You'll make <laughs> yeah. the boundary smaller. It's right. Break it. We'll make it on 226. Because I mean, yeah. they were talking yeah. about the ball head getting hit out of the stadium, hitting cars, and I'm thinking, well, that's either it's a jolly small stadium or the guys are just getting stronger, one of the two. But I think it's the first option. But anyway. <laughs> so I think it's great. You look at cricket bats have changed so much over True. the years as we've been played. And you look at the cricket bats as a play today, these things are huge. I mean, we played some of those batters with 2.5, 3 pounds of cricket bats. Yes. You don't, uh, and it was... 
an inch thick. I mean, you look at these things today. I mean, they they, they 1.82 two, two kilos, and they're not even and they're three times the size of, of yeah. those three times that we had. Yeah, yeah. And it's just ridiculous how they're making them uh, these days. They're making huge, and if middle of the ball, it'll go anyway. No, it's true. It, it almost seems like the you know the shorter version of the game is focused more on, on entertainment, whereas your yeah. your, your, your um, first class, your four day, five day competitions are focusing more on being like pristine and just yeah. playing cool. I see cricket. It's it's interesting to see where cricket's going. That's the impression I get. So yeah, it's, it's interesting times, <laughs> but still yeah, a fantastic sure. game. Yeah. Marek, it's been it's been absolutely brilliant to chat to you. Thank you so much for your time. It's an absolute pleasure any time, man. Give me a shot any time. No, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Maybe we can assess um, the upcoming... Because we're interested to see what happens yeah. with our local competition, what happens there. Yeah, it will be. It will be very interesting. Yeah, because chat to Alan yeah. Donald, and he, he's they basically training. You know, they're going ahead. So, it's, yeah, I'm sure it'll be soon. Yeah, I'm sure. No problem. <laughs> no, very quality, man. Thanks so much. Thank you, mate. All the best. Thank you. Well, then, man. No problem. Yes, yes. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Uh, bye. Bye-bye.